Okay, so welcome to this uh, first uh, uh, discovery lecture series talk. Uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome here my mentor, uh, Professor Rory McGreal. <laughs> he is a UNESCO Commonwealth of Learning ICDE Chair for Open Education Resources. Did I miss any? No, that's oh, good enough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, when I, uh, before I joined Athabasca University, uh, he was uh, Associate Vice President of Research at Athabasca University, and he is the one who brought me there. And he is the one why I stayed there so long. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, he, the kind of vision he had, the ideas, and now his passion about uh, open education resources uh, is just amazing for me. Uh, so without any further ado, I will invite you to uh, maybe give a little more about yourself okay. and uh, then tell us where we should go. Okay, thank you, uh, Kinshuk. Yes, uh, as part of my uh, duties as a chair, uh, you will find that uh, uh, my presentation is very biased in favor of open educational resources. So. Uh, with that caution, uh, I think I can uh, start by saying that the slides are all open educational resources. You can use them. However, some of the images are under fair dealing or fair use laws in the United States. And uh, I want to start off uh, with our support for the uh, Paris Declaration on Open Educational Resources. And this declaration states that in order to meet the Millennium Development Goals of the uh, United Nations, uh, we uh, uh, need to consider using open educational resources, that they will help us to achieve these goals. And the goal is education for all. And uh, it's the belief that open educational resources will form part of what any solution or solutions we come to to ensure education for everybody. Uh, those of you who don't uh, know about open educational resources, I would direct you to the Commonwealth of Learning. They have many publications and uh, this one in particular is a primer, <coughs> Creating, Using and Sharing Open Educational Resources and that give you a good background. There are many other uh, uh, online free books available uh, explaining OER. <clears throat> As an educator, it is my belief that the challenge uh, for the 21st century is this, that by 2025 there will be about 100 million students capable of university and college education around the world that will not be able to access it, either because it is just not available there or they can't afford it. And it is my belief that this is the challenge for educators of the 21st century, is how do we educate all these learners? Uh, John Daniel tells us, uh, he's the former president of the Commonwealth of Learning, uh, that in order to meet this challenge, the traditional way, we would have to build four new universities every week between now and 2025. And of course, we know this just is not possible. So we have to find new scalable ways that we can educate these masses of students. We can use the internet. The internet is the biggest commons. It's uh, the intellectual commons, the intellectual shared knowledge of uh, all of us. And the public domain is a price priceless shared heritage. And what that means is that uh, um, everyone has a right to access information and knowledge on the internet. And there are many uh, companies who are trying to close off parts of it and create closed gardens, we call them. And uh, we need to ensure that people everywhere have access to the world's knowledge. Now, copyright, what does it mean, what doesn't it mean? It was uh, not 
instituted, as many people believe, uh, to protect the author's rights. It was instituted for this reason, to encourage learning and promote the progress of science and the useful arts. In fact, the first copyright law was brought in to limit the rights of the authors and printers, not to give them rights, but to limit their rights in order to promote learning. Um, Jazzy uh, calls uh, this view of protecting the rights of the author as being para-copyright or pseudo-copyright, which uh, the publishers want us to believe in. But let's look back historically about this. Tom Harper reminds us that co the concept of copyright was utterly foreign to the ancient mind. In fact, copyists were the most respected people in society. The early scribes were um, considered saints in many cases. And uh, so the idea that copying was somehow evil or a sin sinful uh, never entered the uh, mind of people, not until very recently. The first copyright uh, law came about actually in Ireland in the uh, 6th century when uh, Columkill or St. Columba, uh, he copied St. Finian's psalm book and uh, the king ruled, King Dermot, that to every cow its calf, to every book its copy. A very strict version of copyright law. And uh, St. Columba did not agree with this and there was a huge battle. 3,000 men died in uh, Sligo in the west of Ireland. And as a result, um, uh, St. Columba won, but then the church <laughs> exiled him uh, to Iona in Scotland, and where he built a monastery, and in fact that's where uh, they brought enlightenment to Europe. They sent monks all over Europe uh, in the Dark Ages to bring enlightenment to Europe. The people supporting this idea of uh, copyright as uh, being a, a, a right of authors, uh, they stand by the idea of, uh, uh, of property. And uh, um, here's an example uh, caught in the act, uh, and it reminds you of people who go around feeling furtive for copying an article or a few pages of a book. And many people feel, oh, I'm doing something sinful here by doing this. Uh, and uh, it's a good uh, illustration of that, of that idea. But the, f the first modern copyright law, the Statute of Queen Anne, 1710, look at the title. An act for the encouragement of learning. It is not an act to protect the rights of authors. Usually, the title of an act gives you a good idea of the purpose of the act. And here, it's an act for the encouragement of learning. And the Copyright Act in the United States is based on Queen Anne's law. It's based on the law. There were four states at the time that had copyright laws, Massachusetts, New York, uh, uh, New Jersey, and I forget which other state. Uh, four states actually had copyright laws. All of them were based on the Statute of Queen Anne. So there's a, a direct line to American copyright. And look at the title of the Copyright Act in the United States. An act to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Again, it wasn't an act to, prom to protect the rights of authors. President Jefferson put it this way. Its peculiar character is that no one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives an instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light with darkening me. So when you allow other people to use your work, you're not giving anything away. You're giving it, but you still have it. And I think that's an important concept, and in fact it's the concept 
It's the difference between theft and infringement. And we need to understand that uh, because uh, publishers keep talking about kids uh, th as thieves uh, stealing music and things like that. And it's totally uh, disingenuous of them. Um, I won't call them liars, but they're maintaining a, a discreet distance from the truth. He also said, I set out on this ground, which I suppose to be self-evident, that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living, that the dead have neither power nor rights over it. This is a pretty basic concept, but now copyright in the United States is seven years after the death of the author. Uh, 50 years in Canada, and it's a way of exerting control beyond the grave. I could tell you a story about this. My, my sister wants to be buried in a cardboard box. Why? Because she wants to make her husband and her brother look cheap. It's, it's what you call control beyond the grave. And, and there's something wrong about that. There's something about it that just does not feel right to most people, as it did not feel right to uh, President Jefferson. He said inventions cannot be a subject of property. This is very important. The genesis of copyright law in the United States never in intended copyright to be a property right. In fact, they were very clear saying this is not a property right, it is a copy right. President Mad Madison, he's put it this way, incentive, not property or natural law, is the foundational justification for American copyright. It is a privileged monopoly. And this is what we need to be calling it because that is in fact what copyright is. It's we give a monopoly to the author for a limited time in order to promote progress, science, and the useful arts. And what it is is a privileged monopoly. We give them that monopoly for that time. Uh, but uh, the uh, publishers don't like using the term monopoly because we don't like it. We prefer the term property. Property, we feel good. Monopoly, we don't like the term, so they don't use it but it is a lie. When they use the term intellectual property, they are lying to us. When we use the term monopoly, this is the correct term. It's the correct term historically. It's the correct term today. John Perry Barlow put it this way, the greatest constraint on your future liberties may come not from government, but from corporate legal departments laboring to protect by force what can no longer be protected by practical efficiency or general social consent. So they're trying to morph copyright into something that it was never intended to be in the first place. So what does copyright mean? No one owns ideas. They belong to everybody. In fact, there is not an original idea coming from anybody anywhere. All ideas are based on previous ideas. They belong to everyone. They are our common heritage as humans. The copyright holders possess a copyright. Copyright protects the expression of ideas, not the ideas. And holders have a limited right to control their expression of their ideas for a limited time. We give them a monopoly in order to promote progress in science, education, and the arts. What it doesn't mean, clearly in our tradition, in the British common law tradition, uh, is the droit d'auteur, the right of the author. In European law, this is a concept that's based on, on the Napoleonic Code. But this is not part of our tradition at all. So, OER, how do they come into this? And uh, Lawrence Lessig, uh, told us a few years ago that uh, it's great to have copyright for Britney Spears protecting her songs. This is wonderful. 
But in education, it just doesn't fit that way. We need to share everything. Education is about sharing, and it doesn't fit. So, leave Britney Spears to her strict copyright, and we should move over to open our resources and share them among ourselves. <coughs> UNESCO had this definition, technology enabled open provision of educational resources for consultation, use and adaptation, community of users for non-commercial purposes. Actually, they've dropped the non-commercial purposes. Even if you want to make money on it, uh, that's fine. Nobody has a problem with that anymore. So, they can be uh, textbooks, OER, they can be movies, they can be uh, curriculum material, they can be audio files, uh, they can be games. Any of these things could be OER. The key is that they're openly licensed. Um, it comes from the idea of learning objects, where you have a component, let's say a, uh, a picture or um, a, a, not, a, a physical object that you use for teaching and you put a number of components together and you create a lesson. And you put a number of lessons together, you get a module. And you put a number of modules together and you get a full course. And you can even put courses together and create a full program. All of these at each level could be an OER. The OER could be just that simple photo, or it could be the entire program of a computer, computer science program at a university. And uh, this is the concept of uh, granularity, where at all different levels we can use OER. And uh, depending on the teacher, many teachers want to create and develop their own materials and so they would pick this OER and put this one together with that one and add it and that's fine. Another teacher wants the whole package. Just give me the whole package, I'll teach the course. It's like you get a textbook with the, all the materials with it, the tests, everything, and both are possible using OER. The characteristics of open educational resources, we can mix them, we can create a new resource, we can adapt them to multiple contexts, extract things from them, take stuff out, localize it, change it to suit uh, your university, uh, your particular in institution, translate it to another language, or you can reuse or repurpose it uh, for use in, in different scenarios. They're open, you can augment them, edit them, customize them, aggregate them, reformat them, mash them up, and it brings up a new concept for us in education, is that we should start thinking in these terms that we assemble courses, rather than think of terms of developing ourselves from scratch, but start thinking in terms of assembling courses from different OER components that are there. sort of like a uh, IKEA set, which is supposedly easy to do. Well, it's not so easy to put these IKEA sets together, and I want to warn people it's not so easy uh, putting OER together either. There's some skill involved, and uh, you generally would need learning designers to, to help you to do that. Um, we brought in the concept of deboning. That is, we take our courses now that have a commercial textbook we take out the commercial textbook and we put in an open education resource textbook. I can say now our university has saved about two million dollars by doing this. Uh, this is just for this year. Next year it'll be another two million dollars and going on forever it'll be a save. In one course I can describe to you accounting uh, 101. We changed from a two hundred and fifty dollar a year textbook to an OER, 2,000 students times $250, that's our saving in one course. So there's huge savings possible, uh, as well as you gain the flexibility when you use open education resources.
it's related to, uh, but not the same as, the open access movement. Open access is for scholarly articles. And so instead of signing off ownership and giving your copyright uh, to a publisher, Elsevier, and let them make money off of you, uh, you keep the ownership and you publish in an open access journal. And um, I don't know why this hasn't taken off even more than it has. It is growing very rapidly. But our traditional model has been professor writes the article, he assigns the copyright to uh, Elsevier or the publishing company, uh, other professors review it for free, and then they sell it at an exorbitant cost to our university libraries. Well, there's something wrong with this. <laughs> so the publishers say, are now saying, oh, we support open access. Uh, now, to pub you can publish in Elsevier in these journals and keep it open. All you do now is instead of giving them the copyright, you pay them to take the copyright, $3,000 uh -huh. and more in some cases. And uh, other professors still do the review for free. And now that it's open, they charge our libraries even more because they're supporting open access. Um, uh, Martin Weller, in his book, The Battle for Open, he calls it open washing, that uh, they pretend to be open in order to defeat it and to defeat the purpose of it. Now, are OER free? I get this if there's a publisher in, uh, in, in the uh, talk I give, you know. Oh, but they're not free. You know, somebody has to pay for them. Well, duh, yes. They're not free. Somebody has to pay for them. They are free for the students. They are free for the teachers who use them. But of course somebody has to pay for them. There's nobody saying that this is done freely. Um, a professor can do it, and uh, they can donate it, but it's taken his time. Uh, the university has paid for his or her time. So somebody's paid for it. Um, uh, we can, and we are doing it. We put out an RFP and uh, a, a publisher sells us the copyright to a book, and we use that. Somebody's paid for it. Uh, but it is free to the students. So they're free for the students. They're free for the institution that uses them. Um, there's no unnecessary duplication. So as, uh, uh, if you use somebody uh, uh, else's Psychology One course, an OER, you don't have to develop it. You don't have to duplicate it. Uh, sharing reduces the costs of development. So if you're sharing and using OER, instead of you developing everything yourself in your unit, you only have to develop part of it and use what other people have developed. It removes the cost of copyright clearance, which is a real pain in universities. Is, uh, usually there's a, one or two people assigned, and all they do is call up and ask for copyright clearance. Well, I can tell you that in, in Canada, the Supreme Court uh, uh, ruled uh, a few years ago uh, that uh, fair dealing must, must be interpreted in a large and liberal manner. And uh, there is no other uh, court case in any English-speaking country that contradicts this. And I would suggest that in the United States you have fair use laws, start interpreting them in a large and liberal manner. Um, I don't think they'll sue you because they lost very badly in Canada when the publishers sued us. They lost, the Supreme Court was very, very hard at basically saying, and going back to Queen Anne's law, that educational use is integral to copyright law and fair dealing has always been part of it, and you must interpret it in a large and liberal manner. So you can use a chapters from a book. You can create class copies, put them together. You don't have to uh, uh, worry about that anymore. Now, cost considerations of using commercial uh, content. Uh, developing and improving curricula, you can't do that because it's 
You're not allowed to change it. You're not allowed to do anything with it. Um, with ongoing program and course design, you have to take what they give you. Um, you can't change it. You can add your own stuff, but you can't change that stuff. Uh, planning of contact sessions with students, uh, development of learning materials, design of effective ef assessment. You're crippled when you're stuck with the uh, commercial content. You have to do it the way they want you to do it, the way they have decided it should be done. But OER are free and adaptable. You can do whatever you want with them. Here's an example of a commercial learning service or rent -a book Do you have them in your university, these? Um, the student owns nothing. The student can share nothing. They can save nothing. They can sell nothing. When the subscription ends, everything ends. The publishers own the student's data, not the student. Um, the notes, the highlights, all that the student have put in. And the students can't transfer the data because the data they've created in the ebook is not theirs. It belongs to the publisher. And uh, David Wiley put this out. Uh, uh, I think it's gone up a dollar now. This was yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah. Netflix, 20,000 movies, $8. Hulu Plus, 45,000 TV shows, $8. Spotify, 15 million songs. $10. Total, $26. Course Smart, one, one <laughs> biology text, $20.25 a month. There's a huge discrepancy there in using commercial ebooks. Now, how open is an open license? We use, there are a number of open licenses, and the only one I'm going into today is the copyright uh, license and the Creative Commons. And Creative Commons license is not equal to public domain. The public domain is for older, older articles, um, and uh, uh, they keep trying to keep, uh, sorry, older content, they keep trying to keep older content out of the public domain, the publishers as much as possible, trying to extend it, uh, extend uh, uh, backwards the, the time frames. But uh, um, the public domain is, okay, you've got uh, Mark Twain, 19th century. Anything in the United States before 1923 is public domain. In Canada, it's before 1945. So you have now Hemingway is... Uh, uh, books are becoming, they're, they're public domain in Canada, but not yet in the United States. Uh, that's the public domain. Now, what happened was in 1963, we agreed to the World Intellectual Property Organization view that everything was copyrighted. Before 1963, <coughs> you had to put a C with a circle on to make it copyright. Otherwise, it was in the public domain. That was the default. But we agreed now that everything is copyrighted. So if you want to share your work with other people, you, you need to put a, a share license on, Creative Commons license. Otherwise, other people cannot use it without your permission. And so if you get an email from your friend and you forwarded it to another friend without requesting permission, you're breaking copyright you must ask permission. And if you haven't asked permission, we all do it, right? <laughs> We're all breaking copyright all the time. Sort of like in, in uh, Nazi Germany, the, the Gestapo would go and uh, uh, they'd say, oh, they've got to be dealing, they've got to be doing breaking the law somehow. We just pick them up and we'll find out what it is. And we're all stuck in that situation. Uh, but the way to get around it is to put a Creative Commons license on, and that is permission for people to use your work. And uh, it, uh, this license, it avoids your automatic copyright restrictions, which I've just described, so you don't have to worry about them if you put a CC license on. 
It's for different countries, different languages. In fact, now there's an international license that's available for good in all countries. And there's a license generator that you can go to online and it puts it in human, legal, and machine language. So language that you can read and understand, one that lawyers can read and understand, and one that machines read and understand. And uh, what you're agreeing to is that others can copy or change without permission your work. Uh, uh, you, you keep your author's rights, you still own the copyright. The copyright belongs to you, uh, but you restrict some freedoms. For example, attribution or reuse uh, or whether it can be used commercially or whether people can change it. And uh, here's a picture of the site you can go to to get uh, the, the, uh, uh, your content into a, a, a Creative Commons license. You go there, you just click, click, click through it, and it generates human, uh, 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 legal, and, uh, and machine uh, languages. So the four restrictions are here. The two on the left are the ones we recommend. They are open. That is fully open resource. And that is attribution. Well, you have to put the author's name on anyway, because if you don't, that's called plagiarism. We're not allowed to do that. We can get fired for doing that. So that's pretty obvious. You have to put that restriction on there. And share alike means that anyone can use it but if they, and change it, but if they do, they must use the same license. They cannot change the license. If you choose no derivatives, that means anyone can use it, but they can't change it. And we don't recommend that. We don't think this is a good idea for classroom uh, teaching or teaching online. Uh, but it does have its uses. For example, you may have a scholarly article that you don't want changed. You want people to use it as is. So there are uses for it. It's not uh, totally negative. We don't recommend it if, if you can get away without it. For example, I, I'm the uh, uh, co-editor of uh, Erodal, an open uh, uh, journal, and uh, um, we, we just have a CC BY license. We've never had a problem of anyone changing the articles or anything, but, but some people worry about it. Um, the last one is non-commercial, and this means is if you still have the vain hope that you're going to make money out of it, and you don't want somebody else to make money, you put a non-commercial onto it, and uh, that way anyone makes money on it, or wants to make money, they have to come to you for permission, and you share in the money. Uh, but uh, um, I haven't seen too many making money by putting a non-commercial license on it. Interesting, the act of reading by itself is an exercise that will almost always constitute fair dealing even when it is carried out solely for personal entertainment, or enlightenment or entertainment. So really, reading is fair dealing, no matter which way uh, you look at it, and, and fair use in the United States. Some people get very worried that they're reading something. Oh, am I have right to do this? Yes, you have every right to do it. And here, you can see intellectual property and the judge there He's saying, "Oody woody, sweet patootie. It's neither intellectual nor property. And uh, again, uh, we need to return to the correct term for it, which is a privilege monopoly that we give to people. Again, why do they use property? Well, William Blackstone, uh, back in the 18th century, uh, put it this way, there's nothing which so generally strikes the imagination and engages the affections of mankind as the right of property. People love the idea of property. Or that, or that soul and despotic <laughs> dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in total exclusion of the right of any other individual in the universe. And certainly this idea of property has become uh, very sacred to us, and that's why the publishers use that term instead of monopoly. We don't, we don't like monopolies. 
I think that's since Theodore Roosevelt broke them in the early part of the last century. So, intellectual property, is that what it is? Or is it a manifestation of government intervention in social relations? It's similar to imposing duties, restricting freedom, and inflicting a burden on users. And we give, <coughs> this, this monopoly we give is the same as imposing duties, restricting freedom, inflicting burden on users, but we believe it's worthwhile in order to promote learning and the useful arts. So we know it's not a good thing, uh, but for a limited time we allow it, and in the, originally it was 17 years, which you could apply for another 17 years. Um, now it's 70 years past the death of the author. Um, so it, it's gotten a bit ridiculous, the length of time. Uh, <clears throat> but nevertheless, it is a monopoly. And we're not against it. We're not against copyright. As I said earlier, Britney Spears needs this type of thing. This is wonderful. And if I were to write a book, The Fifty Shades of McGrail or something like that, I'd want to copyright it. But uh, my, my learning object book was a bestseller, 326 copies. I didn't make any money on it, but uh, it was a bestseller, according to the publisher. Um, in education, we're just not going to make that uh, that amount. Now, some people do with textbooks. There's some selling 100,000 textbooks and making lots of money. Well, those professors, I don't even blame them supporting the publishers. You know, but there's so few of them compared to the 99% of us who write books and don't get anything from it. I mean, why are we going down that road? <coughs> now, Digital locks, or it's known as digital rights management in the United States. Um, in Canada, we call it technological protection measures. But uh, it's a digital lock that they put on your devices to make them defective so as that they don't work properly. And uh, one of the earliest examples was with Animal Farm. Do you remember that? It was about seven or eight years ago where Amazon sold Animal Farm and somebody protested about it and uh, um, they went into people's computers and took it back. They just went in and just took it off their computers, people who bought it. And uh, with digital rights management, they can do that. And uh, it's been, uh, um, it, it, it's a bane. I'm gonna go into that a bit more, why, how dangerous this is. There's three common types of digital rights management from Amazon, Apple, and Adobe. They have different systems and they completely control the systems. Um, they can uh, go into your, with the digital rights management, they can go in and pretty well do whatever they want with your device. So, who's really losing? Uh, the Sony root kit, have anyone remember the Sony root kit scandal where they put in digital rights management and it destroyed your operating system on your computer? Any obstacle that makes a record harder to listen to is bad news for the artist that made it. And this is what happened. They put in all kinds of digital rights management on songs and the pirated version was better. And I can remember, I. Uh, I started my computer journey with a Commodore 64. Tells you how old I am, but never mind. The, uh, they had a, a uh, uh, the word processing software was called Paperclip. And you got what you called a dongle. And you had to put the dongle into the port in the back in order for your Paperclip to work. <coughs> and all the time, where's that effing dongle? Where, the, where did I put that damn thing in? Oh, I left it at home and I wanted to work at the university. And it was a nightmare with this dongle. So I joined this computer club at, uh, I was at McGill University at the time and these guys hacked through it and uh, we, all, uh, we all shared it and we all got pirated copies of it where we didn't need the dongle. It <laughs> The pirated version was more useful than the 
uh, than the uh, uh, official version. And that's what's happening with all of this digital rights management. Now, with digital rights management, what they do is, maybe not all of these things, maybe it's some of these things, but I found all of these things uh, in different uh, e-textbooks. Uh, uh, e you can't copy, paste, annotate, or highlight. Or if you can, they own what you copy, paste, annotate, and highlight, not you. Text-to-speech for uh, important for visually disabled people, you can't use uh, uh, their, their, uh, um, their applications. Format change, you can't move it from a Mac to a PC. Uh, move material, you can't even move it from one PC to another PC. Um, can't print it out, it, it, it stops that. You can't move it geographically. I had, a, I had a book, I was going to read it on the plane. I just bought it, and it said, you have no access to the internet. You can't, they can't verify that you own it. So I couldn't read it. So I got to Paris. I was in the hotel, I'll read it. I went and it is not available for use in this country. So you bought your book and you can't read it. I mean, people are going all over the world now, everywhere. And they, they have decided on their own to divide the world up in the way they want it to be divided up. So a uh, big problem moving geographically, <laughs> a really big one, after an ex they put in a dead, uh, a dead date, so as after the exam, the student loses, uh, loses the material. And can you imagine, student just finished calculus one, and he's gonna take calculus two, and his textbook disappears. I mean, very bad for us in education. And unlike a print book, you cannot resell your ebook. And digital rights management needs deep permissions into the operating system. It can stop normal operating system functions. They control your device. They can go in and control your device however they want. <clears throat> How many of uh, do you have these here? Access codes? where now you get the commercial text and now they have to get an access code and you have to pay for that and charge for that. Another huge problem uh, with uh, commercial content. We have to get it away from that. And there's, I should have waited to tell your story, my story to that one, but I got excited earlier on and kept on about it. But yeah, that's what it looked like. This is the problem. Your device is your property. And uh, DRM, uh, it restricts our freedom. That is, your device, your cell phone, that's your property. Your iPhone, that's your, that is property. That is real property, you own it. And uh, what they're doing is restricting your freedom to use your property and we're letting them get away with it. Here's a simple question. Can we not own and control our own property? They're putting handcuffs onto our devices, um, but we're innocent. We've done nothing wrong. But they handcuff us deliberately. How many have seen this? The uploader has not made this video available in your country. Maybe you don't see it as much in the States. We see it all the time in Canada. And this seems far. Um, I believe it was Senator Hatch in Utah introduced it to the Congress about 10 years ago that uh, destroy your system if you uh, are using uh, illegal pirated content. Luckily, it didn't go anywhere. It, uh, people laughed it off. They said, it's just ridiculous. But that's what, that's what the publishers wanted. Error 53. Who's heard of Error 53? I hope nobody here has heard of it. One of the worst things that can happen to you. Your iPhone. If you take your iPhone to an unauthorized iPhone dealer for repair, the next time you upgrade the operating system, you will get error 53, and it disables your iPhone. It cannot be used again, ever. 
it cannot be fixed. You have to buy a new iPhone. And this was discovered uh, last uh, May by a reporter. And of course, they, you, these are absolutely necessary devices for reporting now. He was a foreign correspondent in Kosovo. And in Kosovo, they don't have an Apple dealer. And he had a problem with his device, so he went to a computer shop and they fixed it for him. And it worked fine. He got back to England, and a month later he upgraded to the next uh, operating system and he got this error, error 53. So it is a very real threat of them controlling your devices and uh, uh, basically making them useless. And you can't do anything about it. I have this picture because uh, Cory Doctor have brought this up. I, I've been on about this uh, uh, digital rights management for years, but it never occurred to me just how serious this issue is. It's far more serious than just textbooks. A farmer in Australia with his John Deere tractor had a problem with John Deere and they disabled his tractor. They all work with software now. A modern tractor can't work without software. But he doesn't own the software. John Deere owns the software on his tractor. And if they have a dispute with you, they can just shut it down and you, it's, you cannot use it. You cannot work with it. Um, cars today. You don't own your car. You have a right to use the software on your car. And with digital rights management, you can't go in and find out how it works or what's happening or fix it. You're not allowed, you can't do that. And uh, hackers can. Hackers can go into your car and do all kinds of crazy things with it. But this is very serious stuff. Even more serious, what about heart pumps? They're protected by digital rights management. You don't know what it is. Or how about voting machines? Your voting machines, you don't know what's in there, you don't know how it works, what's happening, nor can you get in there because it's got a digital lock on it. You can't find out what's happening. So this is a very serious issue, and I'm hoping, I think there's people now in California wanting to take this to the courts uh, to protect us from this because it's, uh, it's far more serious than just textbooks. Now, on top of the digital locks, they also have digital licenses. How many here have read their digital licenses before you click on I agree? There's one nerd in the back. I'm a nerd, I've read a lot of them, two nerds. Nobody reads them, some of them are 68 pages long and even if you read them you're scratching your head wondering what it means because it's, it's written in legalese, not in, not in English. But when you click on I agree, what are you agreeing to? Well, you're agreeing to their right to put the digital lock on and block you from doing all these things that I just mentioned. You've agreed to that. You've also agreed that the owners have no liability, even if the product doesn't work. Well, in British common law, which is in America as well, it goes back, this goes back centuries, is if you sell somebody something, there's an implicit guarantee that it works. Unless you put as is on the, on the receipt. Um, it works. Well, you've agreed that it doesn't matter if it doesn't work. You've agreed to that. You've agreed that they can invade your computer without further permission and collect and use your personal data. You haven't agreed that they can use your data related to their software. You've agreed that they can use any of your personal data, anything that's on your computer. You've agreed that you have a privilege to use the product, not to own it. So you don't even own it anymore. It's uh, theirs. And it's pro you're prohibited to show your content to anyone else. By the way, this is a criminal offense. Can you imagine being in jail for showing your content to somebody else? You'd be pretty low on the prison hierarchy, wouldn't you? It's a pretty scary thought. But uh, 
you've agreed to this. You're prohibited to show your content to others. How can we work in an educational environment with this? That the, you say, oh, this is an interesting uh, formula. Look at this, Bill. No, nope, too late. You know what a, the licenses say? Is if you do this, you must immediately delete the application from your computer and contact, inform the, uh, uh, the, the owner of the application. And you must accept that you have no rights. You've agreed that you no longer have fair use rights. So all of those things you've agreed to with your digital license. And Brian Rakowski put it this way, we're going to own all of your shit without, whether you like it or not, deal with it. But if you go to open e-textbooks, you can copy, paste, text-to-speech, move material, move geographically, reuse, remix, remash, <coughs> and retain your privacy and digital rights. It's a way, let them put in all their restrictions. If we move to OER, it doesn't matter. That's why I believe that OER are essential for e-learning implementations. Not that they're nice things to do and we should be thinking about it, but that they're essential, that we cannot work as educators with the restrictions that are put on us uh, by the uh, publishers. <clears throat> Here's an example of one lesson. They have the right to reasonably inspect, announced or unannounced, and to audit your records and inventory and use of the software whether located on the licensee's premises or elsewhere at any time. You've agreed they can come into your house and without announcing anything and check your records and, uh, and do what they want with them. So, it brings up this question. Do you own what you pay for? Very interesting question. They've they brought a, it's, it's a new concept in the world. They control you. Look, they can control how, when, where, and with what specific brand of technological assistance audiences are able to access content. And there's the map of the world. That's their map of the world. They've divided it up the way they want to, uh, to make sure that uh, they can keep their profits. They brought this new concept into the world. You buy but you don't get. Do you remember the world the way it used to be, as if you bought something, you got it? You know, if you bought a hammer, you could hit any kind of nail with it you wanted. You could choose the nail that you wanted to hit it with. But with these applications, they decide what you can do with what you bought. They decide that. It's a, a, a totally new concept. You buy, but you don't get. Your, uh, they control how you use your device, your property. Commercial learning service or rent-a-book. Uh, students own nothing. Oh, I think we've seen that one before. Uh, David Wiley put it this way. When you subscribe to content through a digital service, the publisher achieves complete and perfect control over you and your use of their content. Cory Doctor put it this way, there's no theory of capitalism that says that my private property should be regulated by the state <coughs> because there's a copyrighted work inside of it. And this is a very important concept and this needs to go uh, to the courts now because everything you buy has software in it, even your fridge. With intelligence now, you'll go down at the night and they'll say, what are you coming here at this time of night for, fatty? You know, <laughs> there's, there's all kinds of uh, different uh, applications, but everything has software in it. Everything has digital rights management in it. And uh, um, as Cory Doctorow says, you know, where's the theory of capitalism that says that they can do that to your property? Audrey Waters put it this way. She calls it the post-ownership society. 
We all just share and rent on the powerful platforms of Silicon Valley billionaires. Uh, this is far from a satisfactory alternative. And why David Wiley tells us again that openness is the skeleton key that unlocks every attempt at vendor control and lock-in. So let them go that way with their strict regulations and everything. We go open education resources, open access, and stay away from all of their uh, shenanigans. I mean, the reason they're pushing so hard in education is that educational publishing is the most profitable part of the entire publishing industry, by far. Forget about Harry Potter, Fifty Shades of Grey. They make money once in a while, it's great, but they get, it's a constant cash cow, educational publishing. Every year they make a fortune, all the time. They pull in the money, it's the gravy train for them. And the way we get away from that is by opening up. So how can we participate? Well, we have the OER Chairs Network, and all these beautiful people around the world, <laughs> some of us not so beautiful, <laughs> uh, in Canada, New Zealand, Brazil, Holland, Mexico, Slovenia, uh, the UK, um, these are chairholders in open educational resources, and we work together to promote OER. We have started the Global OER Graduate Network, where people are studying for a PhD in some aspect of open educational resources, join this network of others. And now there's uh, about 25 graduate students, doctoral students, uh, half a dozen postdocs and about a dozen professors who work together on this global OER graduate network. If you have any students who are studying uh, uh, OER, contact me and I can put you in touch with them. The OER Knowledge Cloud, this is what we put together. It now has 1,300 scholarly articles and reports about OER. So these, they're openly licensed, but they're not OER, they're reports about OER for people studying issues related to open education resources. That's an example of some of the documents available there. <coughs> the OERU, um, we are involved with it with about 30 other institutions on five continents, and it's to address this problem. Learners who access OER and acquire knowledge and skills can't have their learning assessed and accredited. And this is a big problem in Canada, and I suspect in the United States too, is where we have the most well-educated taxi drivers in the world. They come to Canada and they have great skills and education, but they can't get it recognized. And so we need to find ways of getting it recognized. And this is one way uh, that we're addressing this and other problems. <clears throat> the traditional model of a university is on the left. Our students, using our faculty, take our courses and we give them our credential. The OERU model is any learners anywhere, they don't even have to be students, uh, using any faculty or any mentors, anyone who can help them, using any materials, OER particularly, but any materials, but if they want an Athabasca University credential, they take our assessment. If they want a University of Southern Queensland in Australia c credential, they take their assessment. And uh, that's the model we're looking at in order to give free, and we're coming out in April, free first year university online. It's going to be available. You just pay for the exam. And uh, um, that's a model that we're, we're going to be testing out in the, in the <coughs> spring. However, with all that's going on, if you're not confused by all this, you don't understand. The reason you're confused is because the world has become very confusing. Be very careful of people who know exactly what's going on. They're either charlatans or fools. Everything you know is wrong. Every day computers are making people easier to use. 
innovation always produces hostility among those who prosper in the old paradigms. I'll finish off with this. The Royal Society in the UK is the oldest scientific society in the world. And they say that the restriction of the commons by patents, copyright, and databases is not in the interests of society and unduly hampers scientific endeavor. And <clears throat> Reverend Frame says that to penalize consumers in order to give special benefit to an industry might well come under the biblical definition of theft. So I was saying earlier that it's not theft, it's infringement when you download a song or whatever. Uh, but he's saying that by uh, closing off parts of the internet and stopping people from being able to access all kinds of content, that that could be considered theft. That, uh, that's a very real problem we have with publishers. When they take things away from us, that is theft. And the previous pope put it this way, on the part of rich countries, there is excessive zeal for protecting knowledge through an unduly rigid assertion of the right uh, to intellectual property. What does that tell us? That both science and God are on our side. We are on the side of the angels. <coughs> I'm going to finish off now with this story about the frog. If you put a frog in water and you slowly heat it up till it boils, by the time it boils, he can't jump because his legs are cooked. And I tell the story because the technology is bubbling all around us and at some time we've got to jump and if we don't jump we're going to be cooked. Well, I put this story out on the internet and I got an email back from another country and it said, very sorry Dr. McGrail, but at 45 degrees Celsius a knee-jerk reaction in the right anterior something something muscle of the uh, frog's legs causes it to automatically eject itself from the water. And I'm thinking, oh my God, there's people all over the world putting frogs in water and boiling them because of my story. <laughs> so, so I had to put out a disclaimer. I said, there seems to be a cultural misunderstanding. I said, uh, um, I come from the maritime region of Canada and there we do not let the facts interfere with a good story. So I'll finish with that and open yeah. for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I do have a question from the stream. Uh, there is a question of whether or not we have the ability to save up these slides and present them along with the video for them to peruse later. What kind of permissions this do you have This is a disappointment to me. My, <laughs> this is a disappointment to me because my whole talk has been about open education resources. I put up a big black slide right at the front that these are open. I mean, anyone can use them, and they're on, they're on your computer here. Anyone can use them. My one caution is that some of, some of the images are under fair dealing or fair use in the United States but that means you can use them for an educational purpose. So, so yeah, it's a big disappointment to me. <laughs> People aren't listening. Yeah. Yes? We've been um, worried for a while um, about um, the property of the publishers that you mentioned, whenever you use their resources, and especially uh, the dangers of big data, where uh, these kinds of things are in the case of minors, um, the discussion in the U.S. recently has been even that the parents actually never gave permission. And so should the school be held responsible for students um, being given a textbook? And in Texas, we uh, certify textbooks for the whole state. And so you can take it up to whatever level you want. But I, I wondered if you could um, uh, give a, an opinion, I, I think I know the answer, but in our particular case here in Texas, it seems like there are several layers of problems, 
even beyond the idea that education uh, knowledge is meant to be shared that um, that are uh, dangers that the kinds of systems <coughs> that publishers have put in place are imposing on us. Yeah, I've only touched the surface. There's going to be all kinds of other issues like that. I mean, privacy uh, of students. I mean, they own the data that they collect. The parents don't have any control over that. But uh, to me, I think, I guess it depends on the laws in the different states. But if a parent were to sue the school board and say, you can't use my uh, child's uh, without permission, it's going to go through some process. And uh, again, I think that the publishers will win because they can buy off the politicians. So the answer is what you guessed is OER. Go to open education resources. You don't have that problem with people, yeah, with the publisher. But they want that data. That data is as important to them as selling the books to you. This is they they sell that data, uh, uh, and and make a lot make a lot of money out of it. So it is it is a major concern. <coughs> yeah. Well, you might still have that problem. Um, even with open educational resources. So Barnes and Noble and many others are packaging the openly licensed materials in their own systems that make it easy to use, where they've gathered some additional material from various places and allow you to customize it and things. Uh, and then, um, but to use that, it's still a closed system, so you're still, the student still to buy an access key, and they're probably agreeing the terms of use and such things like this. So um, uh, are you concerned about a, a re-enclosure? Yes, uh, well, I, I touched on it, but thanks for bringing this up. Um, uh, uh, Martin Weller published a book, it's available open access, The Battle for Open, and he calls this open washing. Is, so uh, the publishers are saying now, well, uh, oh, we support open. You know, we, we support it, and they're building these things so they have their, uh, their controlled space where you pay them so much a month forever. And then you use their uh, uh, application in order to access the OER. And not only that, then they're collecting the data <laughs> and doing it. So they're using OER in order to promote their own profit interests. So it is a problem. And uh, um, I think we should avoid that and stick to open source applications. Um, but uh, it's a battle. Uh, uh, as Martin Weller puts it in his book, it's a battle for open. Is they're going to try to close it any way they can, because it's so profitable. I don't blame them. The uh, 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 president of Elsevier uh, made four and a half million pounds last year for publishing our stuff. <laughs> we give it to them for free. So, I mean, we give it to them for free. We review it for free and they sell it to us back to us at an enormous profit and they make the money. I think there's about eight vice presidents who are making over a million pounds a year. I mean, we're giving it away to them, really. We're, we're just shoveling money towards them all the time. They're not going to go without a fight. They're going to keep it up. Yes? Yes, yes they do. They do a lot of good things and they charge us for it. They charge us heavily for it. And uh, uh, we, can, um, we can do that ourselves. We can have service. We could, we could actually contract with them at a reasonable cost rather than uh, at the ridiculously high cost that they give to us. 
and we contract with others and do it ourselves or do it with other publishers and let them make a profit on it. I'm not against profit. I think they, they should, but it is exorbitant profit they're making off of it. This is, it is ridiculous the amount of money we're paying them. And um, how about we can keep our copyright rather than give our copyright to them? And um, these vendors are making all this money. I'm a reviewer. Why won't they pay me to review it? I won't review for a commercial uh, publication anymore unless they pay me. When they ask me to review, I say, you know, give me a hundred dollars and I'll donate it to the open uh, education movement. They don't give me a hundred dollars. <laughs> but why, why would anyone review for them for free? They're making a fortune. You know, if it was a charitable organization, I do it for free. I do it for free to all any open a access publication. I do it for free. But I'm not going to do it for free for them to make this huge amount of money. But to say they don't do it, yes, they do do good. Yes, and we need to have that done. But we don't need to pay that kind of money for it. And what we can do is instead of paying $10 million a year to, to them, is take one million of that and start supporting open education and open access. And in a few years, it'll be less than a million and it'll only be a reasonable amount and everything will be open and available. And uh, uh, to say they're opening up and making it accessible, no, they're not. They're closing it down. If you're not a member of a university, uh, you cannot access the, the Elsevier's content. Thompson, you can't access that content. Only the people who've paid can access, or the students in those universities that have paid can access the content. So they're not making it available. This was true in the past, before the internet. And I, I had no problem with it before the internet because, in fact, back then they didn't, they weren't as exorbitant. <laughs> they weren't charging as the huge amounts of money they charge us now. And there was no other way of doing it, or we, we couldn't figure out another way of doing it. But now it's obvious, you know, open it up. And uh, they're taking advantage of it. Yes? So earlier you showed a quote from Cory Doctorow um, in which he was talking about um, uh, terms of use, I believe, like on websites or from mm -hmm. software, and said something about um, the state uh, intervening in this relationship, right? And so I was a little puzzled by the quote. I was thinking, well, maybe he means the state's intervening in that there is a relationship between the customer and the producer, manufacturer, <clears throat> whatever, um, that the state is involved in because they're, you know, arbitrating that contract, that contract, they set the laws of the contract law, but they're otherwise not in that relationship, right, the contract, the state isn't a party here, right, uh, it's just a, a contract between, you know, a customer and uh, whatever, a producer, a uh, manufacturer, um, and so there's a sort of a certain libertarian <laughs> perspective here that says that, well, you know, this is a consenting adult who's entered into this relationship. Uh, they could choose to go somewhere else and not agree to those terms. Um, what thoughts do you have on that? Kind of well, well, my understanding of that statement is that the state is directly intervening and saying, you have a monopoly. We're giving you a monopoly. So leave that out of the equation. Get the state out of it. Nobody has a monopoly. And then come make your agreements. No. The state's given them a monopoly, and so they have that to ride on, and the state will enforce that monopoly for you. Uh, the, the you there, the bit of monopoly to, is the manufacturer or producer, right? Yeah. Not the customer. Yeah, they've given the, man, the, the, the author and the publisher, the state has given you a monopoly. That's what you have, is a monopoly. It's not property. This is nonsense. Uh, you can see this court cases in quite a few states showing quite clearly that it's not property. It is a monopoly. And yes, I, I fully agree. We, could, we should be able to make our agreements, but without that monopoly, without the state monopoly. Yes? What do you think the open, open access and open education uh, should do to create the incentive that authors have when they buy Pay them. Pay so them. Pay them more money than they're getting now from the publishers. So but that's but the take the copyright. Yeah. 
they give instead of they give the copyright uh, to uh, 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 to the publishers, give the prop copyright to a university that opened it, give the copyright to a funding agency that gives them the money. I think we should pay them. So universities should step in. Mm. Yeah, it'll be cheaper. Oh, in the yeah, yeah. Do you take some of the money, some of the money that we save. And as I said, our university has just got into it. We've saved $2 million already. Take some of that money and use it to pay authors and update the material or create new material or whatever. Or use it to search and find other material that's out there. And uh, uh, the other thing is to start using what other people have created. Is And uh, Creative Commons is working on this now of a... Uh, uh, a federated search through repositories so you can easily find open education resources which is a bit of a problem not as big a problem as a lot of people think but it is it is a problem and we're working on the solution to that but I want authors to be paid no problem I want publishers to be paid we're looking at instead of us supporting uh, uh, McClellan Stewart and the big publishers international publishers let's support a local Alberta publisher and so here's, here's a, a, a textbook created by one of our, our professors. You publish it. So you, you do, you put in all the fancy stuff and you do it and make a really good job of it, but you do it locally or have it print on demand and you can charge for that when it's printed. And if it's online, it's online and they can get it for free. And many people still want print. But it's still the argument, but you mentioned also about software and licenses and all that. Um, I think taking that away, uh, it's going to have a problem because what those private institutions have makes a lot of money, but they also create innovation and develop products. So in the absence of that, how do we maintain the same level? Innovation and by educating more and more people, by getting more and more educated people out there and uh, developing things right, and but moving. They want, but they want to be the guys who work in their garage and live on their credit card with the hope of becoming millionaires. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who create those innovations. Yeah, and so do in that. The absence of that, and do that. Again, I'm not against copyright or patents. Mm -hmm. That's fine for a limited time. I think we've gone overboard 70 years after the death. After somebody dies, they're not going to innovate anymore. That yeah, doesn't that make that's any that's sense. That's uh, that's uh, but uh, uh, patent, patents for 17 years is fine. I wish we had copyright for 17 years and, and do that. But while the patent is in, that doesn't promote innovation, that stops innovation. If you look at what happened with the Wright brothers who put patents on all of their machinery for their, for their uh, airplanes, very little innovation took part, place in the United States until the patent expired in the 1920s. All the innovation from about 1904 to the 1920s was in France where they didn't uh, accept American copyright. Uh, so uh, patents stop innovation. They don't, they don't uh, 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 encourage innovation. They stop it. They say only this person can innovate in this area. So it's a two-edged sword. But I'm definitely not against it. I support copyright. I support a limited monopoly, even though it is an intervention by the state. So it's not, it's not libertarian. But I think sometimes the state should intervene. And I do believe in that, that they should. Yes? Um, do you mind Mm -hmm. Well, there's all kinds of uh, lessons out there and components and things and you have to, as a designer, you're looking at your course, instead of developing yourself from scratch, you say, oh, that's a good piece, how would that fit in here? And, oh, I'll have to alter that a bit to get it to fit in here. And this piece fits in there, but it doesn't quite fit, I have to move it around here. And it's a lot more complex than we originally f thought. At first, we, we, we used the analogy of Lego blocks. 
And no, it's more complex than Lego blocks. It's uh, uh, putting courses together and assembling them and putting them together. Uh, but uh, um, it is possible, and, but you need people who understand learning design in order to do that. Or just get the whole package. One of our computer teachers, he wanted to do a com green computing course. Kinchuk knows about it. And uh, he came to me and I was chatting to him about it. He said, oh, it's going to take me about a year to develop it. And I said, well, why don't you look online to see if there's an OER? And he said, how do you do that? I said, well, Google green computer course. He was a bit embarrassed because he's a very <laughs> proficient computer person. <laughs> and so we did. We Googled green computer course. Halfway down on the front page, green computer course, Australian National University. OER, Moodle, which is uh, the learning management system we used. He took it home, uh, well he didn't take it home, he went home and looked at it online, and he came back a week later, he said, it's got everything I need. He says, all I have to do is add some Canadian examples, because they were all Australian examples. And he sent the Canadian examples to the professor in Australia, who's using them in his Australian course. So, um, you could do the whole course as possible sometime. But what a lot of people, uh, uh, what we find is that they say, oh, well, I didn't really invent it here and that, and they don't sort of like it. But it's the two types of personalities. Some professors, and I, I believe it's the majority, but I don't know that, want the whole package. And they don't want to deal with creating this and putting this together and taking that out and taking that out. Me, I'm a different type. I like the whole package but then I'll take this out of the package and I'll put this in. I'll, I'll do all, all kinds of things anyway with it. But uh, there's different types and there's different possibilities for the different types of... Do you think because OER can be distributed across the web that it does require the learning design person to be involved in the learning No. to No, if it's the full system. package, you don't need it. And, and if you don't worry about too much about... Uh, I mean, some people are nitpickers. Some people will just accept it the way it is, and that's fine. And if you're a nitpicker, you're going to go and take this. Well, that's not quite right. I'm going to take this one and that one. And, and uh, these are good, good teachers. I mean, it's a good way of approaching it. Uh, but another good way is take the whole packet. Somebody else has thought it through. <laughs> and, you know, you have a lot of research to do, so I don't want to spend time developing a course. And so there's... I think it should be open to everyone. I mean, there's two streams in the open movement that I've found. Is one stream, they're in open because they want to change the way we teach. They want to bring in connectivism and constructivism, uh, uh, other different ways, uh, more personalized learning, and they're in it for that reason, and they support OER as long as it brings those in. Then there's the others who just want free content. They don't want to change anything. And for me, I believe both can coexist. We can have both. Like, that's fine. Let the professor decide. You know, if he wants to just take the whole thing, that's great. And if you want to do working on all different things, do so. Um, I, I would hope that we could get learning designers to work with those that want to put things together. Or maybe they'll learn learning design on their own by doing it. Sorry, I'm overdoing the time. This is great. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we, we are kind of approaching the time, so thank you very much for a uh, wonderful talk and thanks for the question and uh, for the presence. We also had a uh, uh, presence online and uh, this will also go, as I mentioned, YouTube and you have already mentioned that this must be CC. Um, CC by. CC yes. by. So <laughs> we will make it CC by so that yeah. people can use it as they want. Yeah. And we will also put the slides there, so whichever way is possible there. Yeah. So once again, th uh, thank you. And, yeah, uh, and, and CC BY means the publishers can use it. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is. Th thank you very much for your attention and for your very insightful questions. I really appreciate it. Oh, we get a little bag. <laughs>